I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Hope everyone has had a wonderful day. This was the last day of summer. You can mark it on your calendar. It will be 25 degrees cooler tomorrow. Get your jacket ready. That is pretty funny, isn't it? I don't know if you looked at the weather. I don't know if it's 25. But I know it's going to be a lot cooler. So, uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the last day of summer, which until like November 16th, it'll be 98 degrees. So usually that's what happens in Kentucky. Uh, I've asked our brother Lanfear to lead us in prayer, so I'll turn it over to him at this time. Gabby, our dear Father, we're so thankful that we can be here this evening to study uh, your word and learn from uh, the parables. Uh, we uh, pray that uh, you'll be with us through the evening and that uh, the things that we study and what we glean from your word, uh, we pray that we'll uh, learn what you intend for us to, to learn from uh, these parables. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, as we begin our study, we pray you look down on us in tender love and mercy and uh, forgive us of any wrong that might separate us from you. Uh, we pray that you give us wisdom uh, each day in our lives, that we will properly apply principles that we learn uh, from your word and put them into practice. And we pray that you give us uh, wisdom to make uh, good decisions in our lives. Please be with Gerald as he leads our class. Uh, we pray your blessings on the church here, and we pray for peace and unity, and uh, we pray that love will abound and uh, that we will uh, be a people that uh, emulate uh, what we see in the life of Jesus. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the chance and opportunity to be here. Uh, we pray that everything we do will glorify you. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name, amen. This class, we will be doing the prodigal son. I have a two-part lesson on that. Unfortunately, I only have one part to do it, so we'll do a two-part and one-part class, right? Did I just confuse you? I did fractions. Uh, but anyway, we're excited about doing that one. We'll do the prodigal son. That's what we'll end with that one. I think there's a lot of great stuff uh, to learn there on that particular one, so I'm um, pumped up about that one. Tonight, we're going to be in Luke chapter 16. We're going to be doing the rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16, 19 uh, through 31. And I'm going to get Stephanie um, to read that for us. Stephanie's right there, David. Yep. So if you go ahead and turn in your Bibles, Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. It's on. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Thank you, Stephanie. So this is an interesting section in your Bible. I don't know if you kind of flip back and forth, but uh, for a few chapters now, we've been in uh, parable mode. Uh, and we start back in... Uh, Chapter 15, after the disciples are tested, we do the lost sheep in chapter 15. 
We go right into the lost coin in chapter 15. We're going to go right into the prodigal son, uh, which we'll talk about next Wednesday. And then we go into the unrighteous steward, uh, which we've already talked about in this class. We have a few verses here where the Pharisees, uh, he calls them like lovers of money in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 16. And then verse 18, out of the blue, you know, divorce comes up, and, and, and that's a few verses. And then we jump right back in uh, to verse 19, right into this parable. So uh, we've got a couple chapters here that are just right in this parable mode, and he's teaching a, a lot of stuff to them. So uh, an amazing section here. So tonight, you know, we're doing the rich man and Lazarus, I think is an amazing story. Uh, there's a lot to be talked about here. There's some tangents that we can go down tonight that we're going to try not to go down. Uh, there are some questions that I've asked that I can't even answer myself and that you'll probably ask as well. So let's just jump right into this. Uh, I thought this was a good graphic, so I just put it up here. You see Lazarus there depicted as dogs uh, licking him, him, and then you've got um, them eating at their table, and I guess he's looking for, uh, uh, for crumbs there. But anyway, I thought that was a good uh, picture. So the first question you're going to ask yourself, <clears throat> is this a parable? And that's debated. It doesn't say, now I'm going to tell you the parable. Uh, there are, uh, there's a real name used in this, Lazarus. Typically, parables don't have names of individuals. Um, and it doesn't, like I said, doesn't start off by saying it's a parable. But the interesting thing is, is other, another one that we call a parable. Hmm. Um, we'll just, I, I know what the next slide is, so when you fix it, it will get there. Uh, is the unrighteous steward. If you go back to Luke chapter 16, the unrighteous steward starts off exactly the same way as the rich man and Lazarus. Now, also saying disciples, there was a certain rich man who uh, had a steward, and his steward was reported to him to squander all of his possessions. So he actually starts off by saying a rich man does not say this is a parable. Now, this one is not actually uh, debated, at least not as much as, as uh, rich man and Lazarus, whether it's a parable or not. Also, there's this whole discussion about, well, parables are kind of made up ideas and stories. Yeah, they're real life examples, but they're not real situations. Jesus here is talking about Hades and people going there and torment. So if it, if it, if it is a parable, then we can't take anything that's being said to be, uh, to be true. And, and I disagree with that. I, I think that, uh, you know, he talked about the Levites. They were real people. He talked about a road. He talked about people who did stuff. I mean, lots of the parables were real types of people in real places and real locations and real events. And why can't this be one of those as well? So Anyway, I don't know if there's anything anybody wants to add on that. I typically don't like to get in debates of any kind like this when there's no true answer. Uh, but if you're looking for it to say, this is a parable in the actual text, then this one doesn't have the words, this is a parable. Uh, do a lot of scholars think it is? Absolutely. So I'll open it up if anybody wants to add anything to that. Good. Either everybody's already half asleep or nobody cares whether it is or whether it isn't, but I always like to address that. The other topic that is interesting here, it isn't interesting to us because we never really, probably don't ever think about it. I think most everyone here believes that you die and that there is life after death. When Jesus is telling this parable, there were many views <laughs> about life after death. There were all kinds of views. There were views from every, all over the, the planet. There's probably different groups had different views on this. Uh, Jesus is touching a very uh, difficult topic at this time period uh, in his teaching. Like I said to us, maybe not so much uh, on that. And so, um, and I also pointed out that, that there are still groups today that discount this parable for that very reason. And, and one of the commentators pointed out to Jehovah's Witness. Uh, and, and I'm just putting up here what their belief is from their actual uh, website. Uh, death is considered a state of non-existence based on their understanding of Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living are conscious that they will die, but as far as the dead, they are conscious nothing at all. So when you die, you're not con you're not you don't you are not doing anything. You are you are not conscious at all. I don't know how else to put that. Witnesses believe that the only hope for life after death is a resurrection, which they say involves uh, re, uh, recreation by God and the same individual in a new body. 
They believe that 144,000 people will be resurrected to life as spirit creatures in heaven to be priestly rulers under Christ, but the vast majority of the physical on the earth. So they don't like, they don't believe in this particular parable um, because when you die, you, you don't, you're not doing anything. You're unconscious or you're non-existent or you're still, you're still there, but you're not there. This parable, when you die, you're talking. You know, he's showing that they, they, you do. You're in, you're in Hades. You still exist. And so, uh, so when we say life after death, even today, people have a lot of different views that happen at the moment that you die. And so, this becomes a controversial parable if you're Jehovah's Witness or other, even other religions, because you may not believe what Jesus is teaching here. Anybody want to add anything to that section? I find it really interesting. And I also find it interesting that even the different groups uh, with the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Jews who Jesus would be teaching and preaching to and these parables would go to, the Sadducees obviously rejected the oral Torah, uh, the written law and depiction of the priesthood, collaborative power and enforce um, homage to the Sadducees in Judean society. So um, probably could have skipped that side. According to Josephus, uh, the Sadducees believe that there is no fate God does not commit evil. Man has free will. Man has the free choice of good or even. The soul is not immortal. There is no afterlife. So if Jesus is teaching when you die that you have this, that, that would have been something that would have been interesting. There's no reward or penalties after death. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, but believed contrary to the claim of Josephus in the traditional Jewish concept. So there's some debate. Josephus says they didn't. There's debate whether or not they actually did. I like this graph um, here, there's a graph after this one, that in Acts, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, uh, whereas the Pharisees did. And so here's a graph here that more depicts it. Pharisees, uh, after life, they believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees did not. The Essenes believed in something of a, of a spiritual sense. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this seems like a really simple story about life after death. This would have been very controversial uh, when Jesus is telling this story. And I think Jesus is trying to get people to understand maybe some things about life after death. Any comments or questions on, on the life after death section? All right. Excellent. Okay, so verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen and enjoying himself in splendor. Every day. I think this is the key verse here. I think this verse tells us a lot about this individual. Uh, the first thing I do want to point out is that Jesus' use of a rich man. Uh, this term is used quite a bit. Uh, we see it in Matthew 27. Uh, a rich man from Arimathea came named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. You remember what he did, this rich man? He had a, a tomb already carved out, and Jesus was the first one uh, to be in there, and he was a, a rich man. This rich man seemed to be a very good man and was a disciple of Jesus. So being a rich man is not a negative thing, as we can see from this individual. He was actually a really good guy, and he actually uh, helped out here after Jesus' death. The phrase the rich man again, the rich young ruler, he was faithful in what? In all things. Uh, seemed like a pretty good guy, except for Jesus said, sell everything you've got and come, and, and he left and went there. So once again, rich man is not always used in a negative term here. In Luke 12, uh, here in verse 15, but he said to them, beware and be on your guard against everyone of greed, for not even one who has an affluent does, does his life consist of his possessions. And he told him, the parable saying the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began to tell this parable. And so we see that rich man is listed there. And then we see the unrighteous steward, which we already talked about in Luke 16. This rich man had a manager. Now, none of these that we just looked at a while ago are looked at in a negative, negative way. They, it was just describing who they were. They were a rich person. They, they had that. Um, I, I was going to put a slide. I'm not going to do it. But but define rich. What is rich? What is a rich person? How do, you, how do you define when somebody's rich or when somebody's not rich? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Okay. Yep, first century purple. Yep. Yep. 
What about today? Okay. They have more than the average person. They'd be considered a rich man. Anybody else want to take another stab at it? You're, you're a rich man when you've got everything. So if you were in one of Jesus' parables, would he say, and there was a rich lady or there was a rich man? Just throwing that out there. It's always good to have that little check in your life. All right, Todd. And I think sometimes there's a negativity toward that. Um, but in the examples I just gave you, they weren't looked at as negative. All these were rich people, starting with the guy who took care of Jesus and had the tomb. Um, I'm glad the guy had enough money that he had a brand new tomb. Because uh, it was prophesied that that would happen. And we needed somebody that was going to do that. So it kind of worked out real well for us. But, but, you know, having money or having wealth or being a rich person is not being looked down at any of these passages, except for the one that we're about to look at. Okay, I think David's going to say something. And, and we get to this one. Uh, well, I'm sorry, there's one more. There's a lot of rich people in the Bible. Uh, we got Zacchaeus. Was Zacchaeus, was he a bad person? Chris talked a lot about Zacchaeus, right? His whole, his, one, of his, one of his points, right, Zacchaeus? Uh, you know, no, he, he, seemed like, he seemed like a really good-hearted individual, and so... So anyway, I find it funny. And then we get to this one. This rich man was different. Did you pick up on that? This rich man was different than all the other rich men listed before him. I don't know if you, did y'all pick up on that? This rich man, uh, he was rich and he wanted you to know it. You ever met anybody that was rich and wanted you to know it? kind of funny i've actually met poor people who acted like they were rich wanted me to think that they were rich but but they were actually poor no I'm, I'm, yeah I, I think we've met people like that but but you know ha have you have you met people that they are rich and they want you to know it well if you haven't you're going to meet this guy and that's who this guy was this guy was not just rich he wanted you to know it. He loved being rich. He wanted everybody around him to know he was rich. And he was living life as rich as you could live life in his time. And you're saying, where did you get that from, Gerald? Um, from the text. He held nothing back. And what we see from the other rich guys, you know, they were, they were rich, but, but you know, maybe they lived modestly with what they had. Maybe they gave a lot. Maybe they did different things. But not this guy. This rich man habitually wore purple. He didn't just wear it on Sunday morning for Sunday morning services. This guy wore purple. That was the most expensive color, and he wore it habitually. He wore it every day. He wanted everyone to know, I don't have this one purple shirt. I got seven of them. I can wear one every day. Maybe I got 42 of them. I'm so rich, I can wear a purple shirt anytime I want to. That's how rich I am. You wish you had one shirt. I've got a hundred of them, and I'll wear them and show you. Isn't that funny how the text points that out? Not only was he wearing purple, but he wore fine linen. He's wearing the purple, the fine linen, and joyously living in splendor, not just on vacation, not just on the weekends, every day. This guy was rich, he wanted you to know it, and he lived it every single day. Money was not an issue to him, this guy was living it up. Isn't that crazy that Jesus points him out this way? That's the guy we're talking about here. This is the kind of heart this guy had, this is the kind of life he lived. He was rich, 
He lived it up rich, and he wanted everybody to know how rich he was. You know, there's one guy that always sticks out in my mind. Um, probably one of the, probably, I don't know him personally, if I could be wrong on this, but from what I've read, seems like one of the nicest, richest people that ever, that lived in my generation anyway, or at least in my time frame, Sam Walton. You know, Sam Walton drove an old beat-up truck. Uh, he didn't dress like he had any money at all. And they asked him a question one day about, about his truck. And he says, I just don't believe a big showy lifestyle is appropriate. Why do I drive a pickup truck? What am I supposed to do? Haul my dogs around in a Rolls Royce? Sam Walton, in his time, could buy and have any... He was the richest man. At his death... Uh, he was worth $8.6 billion. That's in 1992, before the, 90, before the, like the, the inflations and everything that's going on right now. Um, I checked today. If he was living right this moment, he'd be worth $365 billion. Because that's what Walmart closed today at. And they're down. Last year, they're actually worth $421. This guy could live any way he wanted to. And he drove an old beat-up truck, wore overalls, had his dogs, and lived a very modest life. You know, we can live and, and do certain things, and I don't know a lot about Sam and other things that he did, but I find it interesting that money didn't define him, and he didn't want people to be defined by the money that he had, and he wasn't showy with it. There might have been things that he bought. He probably had the best dogs. Who knows? You know, I don't know where he got his dogs at. Maybe he had... Maybe they ate the best dog food. Maybe he gave them a whole chicken every night. I don't know. He had the money to do it. But Sam Walton wasn't a flashy guy. And, I, and, I, and when you think about the guy we're talking about, he was rich. He knew he was rich. He wanted you to know he was rich. And being rich mattered a lot to him. And you look at a guy that could do it. Nah, I got no pickup truck. I don't really care. I got enough money to do whatever I want to with. And I, I'm just going to live life however. In Luke chapter 16, picking up in verse 20, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores. In longing to be fed from the scraps which fell from the rich man's table, not only that, the dogs also were coming and licking his sores. I've imagined this story wrong my whole life. I don't know why I imagined this way. I imagine Lazarus practically laying halfway under the guy's table, uh, or being near there and scraps coming down and the dogs all around and, and he's there. And, and, and after I've studied this and looked at it, it, it's not. First of all, he laid at the gate. And it's interesting that it says he laid at the gate. Why didn't he stand at the gate? He probably couldn't walk. He probably, people probably brought him to this gate for whatever reason. I don't know what kind of establishment the rich man owned. But the way this guy lived, it was probably a pretty amazing uh, place. It probably had a pretty amazing gate. I would imagine that if he was rich the way he was, what do you think he probably had every day? Huh? Bacon and eggs. No, he, had, he partied every day. He had rich people hanging out with him. They were coming in and out of the gate. There were parties going on. I mean, they were all living it up, and they had bacon and eggs and, and everything. So... If you wanted something, being at this gate would probably be a pretty good place because there's probably going to be a bunch of rich people coming back and forth. And so Lazarus is laying at this gate, laying there, probably, probably maybe lame. I don't know that for a fact. All, all it says there is he laid there. And, and he's just longing to be fed. And at this day and age, if you can't walk and, and he had sores on him, he had limited to what he could do to make a living. In a very much an agricultural society, uh, he was very limited. And all he was wanting, which was the scraps, which fell from this man's table. Probably a lot of scraps fell from this guy's table. If he was as rich as it seems like, he probably had a ton of food to spread out on the table to show everyone how rich he was. And he probably didn't eat half of it. Who knows what he did with the food. And all Lazarus was wanting was just a little bit of that food. And he was so sick that he had these sores, and the dogs, you know, were going and licking his, his sores. He probably was not able to walk. Uh, it, like David said, was laid. That passive voice in the voice, which means he was passive. Other people laid him. If it was imperfect, that he laid him. 
Yeah, oh, I agree. I, I doubt he could. So he's laying there. We don't know the, the time frame here of how long he laid there or what Jesus is trying to point out, but do you think the rich man ever came in and out of that gate? I would assume so. He, he had to go do rich people stuff. So he had to leave and go do it and come back. And, and he probably saw this guy and probably with a, with a small, small fraction of his wealth, he could have changed this guy's life forever. Probably would have never even missed the money. He could have changed this guy's life forever. But knowing what we know about this guy, who was he focused on? Himself. He was rich, he wanted to be rich, and he wanted to enjoy life to the fullest every day. While Lazarus was laying there, unable to do anything, having sores that these dogs are coming and, and licking and being there. And I, I, I probably, I'm not even sure he wanted to have the dogs even there. Um, I just can't even imagine. So we see the poor man here is laid at the rich man's gate. This guy is so wealthy, he can wear purple every day and linen, and, and just, it just lives it up every day, whereas Lazarus is not. He's covered with sores, and, uh, and he's longing just for whatever scraps he can get uh, from him. And dogs were looking at his sores. So, good thing is I got a picture. Uh, we, I got it. I only have the only picture, though. Uh, but this is kind of a description of what, what gives you an, a visual image that somebody thinks it would look like. Um, and the other thing, when you imagine in your mind, you, you, you think of a healthy person laying there, Lazarus would have looked sick. He, you would have walked by him knowing he hadn't eat properly in a while. Uh, you would have walked by him knowing he was sick and the sores. Um, one of the things that hits me in this parable is that when Jesus saw a situation where somebody was in need, what does it say 100% of the time? And you can go check me if I'm wrong. I'll, I'll repent of that. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 100%. What did Jesus do when he saw people in need or in hurting? What was the first thing a text always says he does? He had compassion. He had compassion. We, we don't see anywhere here that the rich man even, even admitted the guy even existed. Uh, forget the compassion part. I, I think there's something to that. Go ahead. We know that he knew Lazarus because he recognized him and called him by name. Yeah. And he had clearly no compassion for him. He, 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 that even makes it worse. He knew who he was. Jeff? You know, that's an excellent point. He's starving to death. Yeah, great point, Jeff. He's sitting there starving. He, he's laying. Ah, I, you know, I, I don't want to make this visual too much, but I, I can imagine that he's laying there starving, hungry, sick, and probably smelling the food that they're cooking and the parting they're doing, probably hearing them being joyful, probably all the things that are going on, and here he is just longing for the scraps that are there. And, and, I, and I really like the point over here that it, clearly, we see later that he knows who he was. It's not like he didn't know who he was. He knew his name. And he did absolutely nothing for him. And he was blessed with everything under the sun. Felt no compassion. And uh, just, a, just an amazing story here when you, when you take a look at it. And in Luke 16, 22, Now it happened that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels. Uh, to Abraham's arms. Um, you know, what, a, what, a, what an amazing thing. I don't know, I don't know what, what exactly happens here, but the, Jesus is saying that he was carried away by angels when he, when he died. And uh, what an amazing sight. What an amazing feeling to the poor man that his life here had ended, his, his horrible life here had ended. And now he is off to uh, his reward here. The angels take him. Uh, to Abraham's arms, uh, what an amazing transition for him and a glorious thing. Um, do you think at this point, he's like, mm, could I have ten more minutes on earth? Do you think Lazarus is thinking that? You know, if I only had ten more minutes, 
uh, I really wish I could go back. Boy, my life there was great. I miss it already. Do you think Lazarus was thinking that? I don't think he was thinking that at all. He didn't have a problem leaving this world at all. The minute that the angels came to him, it was like, I am so happy this part, this part is over. We don't have time to go to this lesson, but there's a lesson right there. Uh, Lazarus was not holding on for anything here, I assure you. Yeah. But, you know, so when they were here for four times, you know, they were not far from the land of Abraham. Yeah. Right. Oh, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And so we see the poor man is carried away. And it's interesting what the text did here. The text does here in 22. And it says, and the rich man also died and was buried. Now, I, I don't believe that's what happened. And you're, you're saying, Gerald, what are you, that's what the text says. Are you disagreeing? I actually think, uh, uh, do, do you think it was that way? And I'm going to say, uh, do you, th you think that's what it was? And I'm going to say, no. I, I'm sure it was the most amazing funeral that had ever happened. He died, and I bet you that he had the most amazing funeral. I bet they all came. I bet he had it all planned out. I bet it was the most grand place. He had the most grand place he was going to be buried I bet he was in the finest clothing that you could do. I was going to put casket on here, but they didn't have caskets back then, so I took that off. Whatever it was, the perfumes, I bet it was in an amazing event. The finest that money could buy. I think for about 10 seconds, I flipped on the TV this past week, and I'm pretty sure I saw a funeral very similar to that for the last four days. Did anybody see the same funeral I saw? Hey, there ain't going to be any funeral any better than that. There is no, I mean, that, that is the finest. I, I don't know if his was, was that, but I'm, I bet it was close to it. It didn't matter because the text says he died and that was it. The text didn't, it didn't matter what else happened because he was not there anymore. Isn't that interesting? Hey, he died. Well, there was more to the story. It didn't matter what was more to the story because he's gone. It didn't matter what they're happening on earth. He was dead. The rich man died and was buried, and it was over. This was a difficult concept for me when I was a little kid, by the way. I remember my dad had worked for this guy, and this guy came from Texas. He had a big ranch in Texas, and he bought a bunch of land in Tennessee. Big ranch, he called it a ranch. There's no ranches in Tennessee, but anyway, we call them farms, but... Anyway, my dad worked for him. He had all kinds of big, big Texas longhorns there, which nobody in Tennessee had ever seen before because we don't do longhorns. But anyway, he had them and fine cars, and he even let my father and uh, the family live in a home, and just wealthy, 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 wealthy guy. And I was about seven or eight, and he, pa he passed away. And I asked my dad, I said, man, dad, I said, what happened to all of his stuff? Because I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what's he going to do with it all? And my dad, being a profound philosopher, said, son, that stuff's no more worth to him than that rock you see over there in that field right now. <laughs> and, buddy, I thought about that the rest of the ride home. You see, when you die, you don't take anything with you. I don't know if you know that or not. And you're probably looking at me like, well, you're a dummy, Gerald. Uh, yes, you know, we all know that. Well, you know what? I know some people who don't know that. Um, I do. I know some people who hadn't figured it out yet. Um, that when they die, nothing goes with them. You know, there was a whole group of Egyptians who, who thought that, by the way. You know, hence they do the little things and they bury them with all their stuff and all, you know. You're dead. It doesn't matter. Uh, 
I, I have, uh, the last couple years, uh, my, with my dad passing and my, my stepmom passing, I, I have gone through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Um, I, you know, I, you, getting a lot of stuff is not a good thing, uh, having to go through all this stuff. But they left it. They just left it and said, take care of it, Gerald. I'm not, I wasn't happy about it. I'm still not happy about it, to be honest with you, if I'm being really honest with everybody here tonight. I don't like dealing with everybody's stuff, but they left it all and said, deal with it. That's what's going to happen to each and every one of us. And actually, I've, had a, I've got a really interesting view on all that now that I've had to do that multiple times. The guy died and all of his stuff was gone. I'm sure it was an amazing funeral, an amazing event, but it was irrelevant because he's dead. Yes, sweetheart. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I just realized I'm running out of time. <laughs> uh, and he went to Hades. Now, real quick here, this is a tangent I don't want to go down, so I'm gonna, we'll make it real brief here. Hades, I don't know a lot about Hades. What I do know is that the word Gehenna is for hell, and that word is not used here. So hell would have been a final resting place. The, the, the Greek is actually used for the word Hades, um, which, which looks like it's a place before you go to your final judgment. If anybody is a more expert on that or have ever been to either one of these places and can tell me more about it, I will open the floor up. But other than that, you're just, we're just speculating. But Hades just means the unseen realm. Well, I'm sorry? Hades just means the unseen realm. The unseen realm. So, what is Hades? We'll read about it, but other than that, I, you know, Gehenna, Hades, I, you know, it looks like there's going to be judgment regardless when you die. So, Luke chapter 16, 20 through 24, and in Hades, he raised his eyes, being in torment. He saw Abraham and saw Lazarus in his arms, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. And Abraham said, absolutely, because you had mercy on everybody you were around, and mess, especially this, this poor man who was starving. So, yeah, yeah, we'll do that for you. Is that what Abraham said? <laughs> because you were such a merciful individual, yeah, by all means, we'll get you that drop of water. Uh, he walked by a starving guy probably every day and did nothing. Yet he wants Abraham to do, to do that. Um, don't understand how you can see people and talk. And, and, and we can go in a lot of different directions here. But there seems to be some communicating going on here in this parable. Um, rich man's request. He wanted Lazarus to dip his finger and cool off his tongue. I think the thing we, we need to really grasp from this is that the torment is so bad, even in Hades, before Gehenna, that a drop of water on your tongue would be the most amazing thing ever. That's, that, 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 I mean, just a drop. He's just asking for just a drop. So, so that gives you an example. This is taking earthly, remember, earthly things that we can understand to explain the spiritual. I don't think that they actually would dip in the water and all. I mean, I, I don't... I, I, they're trying to things we understand because we're not going to understand, you know, Hades or hell or Gehenna in that terms. And he wants to send Lazarus to his house to warn his brothers. Well, now he cares about the afterlife and he wants his whole family to know about it. It's funny um, how quickly quickly things can change. Um, it, you know, you uh, it, it's it's uh, and I'm trying to get the saying here, but you know, a, a drunk person can, can sober up pretty fast. <laughs> 
when the situation is right, right? I mean, whatever it is, uh, you know, you, your, your mind changes pretty fast. Now his mind is like, oh, whoa, I'm, all I care about now is spiritual. I don't care about the money. I don't care about the finances. I don't care about the, being the rich. I don't want anybody to come here, especially my family. And then we pick up in verse 25. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received good things, but likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm been set so that those who want to go over from here and will not be able, nor will any people cross over there to us. I tried to put a graphic to give you a, a, a picture, but... There's a separation of some sort between, so you can't cross. There is no going over. And then I thought of a really great sermon idea, uh, which I'm not going to do right now, but I'll give, you the, I'll give you the introduction to it. What is separating you from God? So God's on one side, you're on the other, the chasm. And in your life, is it money? This guy had money. This money separated him from God. Is it alcohol? Is it, uh, whoa, my clicker got fast on me. Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? Um, wh what is it? What is separating you, that chasm that's separating you? Because now the rich man has been separated. He can't cross over now. It's done. It's over. What is separating you in your life? On earth, you can fix it. But on the other side, can't be fixed. So what is separating you? And then in verse 27, Then I request of you, Father, not to send me to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not become this place of torment as well. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets to hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. I find this very ironic. Because what was Jesus going to do here in a, I don't know, here in six months? I don't know, here in a couple weeks. I don't know how, what the date is here. Jesus was going to die and be raised from the dead. And did it make a difference? Yeah. Yeah, it made a, it made a little difference. It did in, in the people who want to believe in Jesus, but in the people who don't care about religious things, oh, he didn't raise from the dead, oh, I don't know, I don't you know, they deny it, they don't believe it. But Jesus was around people for, what, 49 days, 50 days? They knew he'd raised from the dead. He had witnesses, and yet people still uh, didn't like it, to the point that, that Stephen, some days later, was preaching a sermon, and they stoned him and said, you know, we don't like what you're saying. And, and so and we have that there. Sorry I ran out of time. Um, I usually don't do that. But go ahead, Jeff. Money did not separate him from God. His heart, yeah. So I had some lessons here, but at the end of the day, the big thing we need to know is that, is that our actions and how we live our lives, there will be a judgment for it. And then there will be a place, heaven or hell. So, okay, all right, we'll do the prodigal son on next Wednesday, and that'll wrap up our, our parables class. Thank you.